This is Twit. All right, great. Can you see my screen okay? Yes, perfect. Okay. So I've pulled up an image here um, and I've got a few things I'll, I'll show you real quickly just to kind of orient things. Uh, this is Lumenzia up here. Um, it actually comes as two panels. So it's got this other panel called Basics loading up in the background here. Um, so it's kind of a two-part deal. And, and this is separate because, you know, this is like the core functionality and you can sort of decide to move this wherever you want to put it and, you know, orient the screen kind of thing. Um, but they, they come as kind of a package uh, deal here. So going through this, like I said, I've, I've got an image that I've opened and I've already done a little bit of work on it. So let me just show you the general principles and then we'll come back and we'll actually do it. So this is just a camera raw smart object that I opened from Lightroom. And on bottom here, this is the original raw with no adjustments at all. And then I went and processed it once for the foreground, right? And I've got, you know, it's not exactly the way I want it. There's other things I'm going to do in the long run, but I've got nice foreground color and detail, but the sky is kind of blown out. It's not showing me, you know, the kind of color and detail that I want to see in the sky. So I took the same image, the same raw, and I duplicated it, but I put in different raw values. So, like, so if we open up this one, we're going to see that, you know, I've got a bunch of different adjustments that I've made, you know, originally in Lightroom carried over here into Photoshop. And then on top, I blended in another version of the image for the sky. And it has this mask on it, which is allowing me to replace the sky, essentially. So we've got the foreground, and then I'm layering the sky on top of it. Exact same image, but inside of it, I've made a different set of choices with the various sliders in here. And so you would never get that kind of precision to apply just here versus just here. And even if you could, the local adjustment tools in Photoshop, if we were to go and pull up like a gradient, you know, right, you just have this set of controls versus, you know, normally in Photoshop, you know, let me escape that. Um, normally in Photoshop, you've got all these other things, the color grading, the calibration, all these other, you know, the curves, these are tools you can't do locally. So by processing this image twice, and then just bringing forward this sky, I get a much better looking result. And you can see in the detail here, these clouds are still a little bit blown out. So I actually process the sky a second time to blend in a little more sky detail. And I probably need to back this one off a little bit and get just kind of the perfect amount of, you know, sky there to, to fix things. But I've got multiple layers and this is not a finished image. I'd still would want a lot, of, I'd still want to do a lot of other changes to it to, to bring it home but I want to show the, the basic setup. And if we look at this mask here, you can see that this is the layer mask. And what this is telling Photoshop with the layer mask is white reveals and black conceals. So this is saying, I want to completely show this sky area because it's all white. And I want to completely hide this foreground from this layer so that I can see the foreground from the layer beneath it. Let me make these a little bit bigger here. It'll probably be easier to uh, see some of this. So with this mask, I get the sky layer and I get the foreground, you know, choosing the sky here and then the foreground here because this one is blacked out. It's, if I didn't have this mask on it, if I shift click it, I sort of disable it. This is what that foreground would have looked like. So ultimately I'd have, you know, one image that's great for the foreground and one image that's great for the sky. But with a layer mask, I bring the two together. And in this mask, the key to making it look really good, the thing you're not going to get with the magic wand is all this little gray stuff in between. And what this is saying is give me a little bit of this layer, but not all of it. So when I'm in a middle gray value, I get partial opacity of those pixels. So these transition areas in this mountain, I'm getting a little bit of the sky version of the mountain here. And I'm also getting a little bit of the background. And if you look there, you can see some of that mm -hmm. color coming through, which is helpful because I do want the light to feel like it's wrapping around the edge of the mountain. I do want to impart some of that color. Yeah. I also have really nice accuracy. If you look here, you, know, you don't see like a halo or some kind of hard edge between this. It's a really nice match between them. If I tried to do that with the quick select tool, then I'd end up with you know probably a pretty crunchy edge and, and things that just wouldn't look quite right. So that's the the general idea of the, the luminosity mask. So in the so, past, in the past, you would have 
and maybe some photographers still do this, you know, obviously there's sky replacement. So people could use some like even Photoshop to do a sky replacement in there. So what's the difference then in what the mask that Photoshop is building and this and, and which one, or, or is it an or? Can I just use both for different reasons? Where, where do you fall on that? Well, if we were talking say sky replacement, right? Mm -hmm. It's never gonna give you this mask to fix these clouds here. Mm. it's, you know, and it's going to give you one version of a mask that whatever it thinks is best. And I can guarantee you that the quality of this mask is going to be higher because it's going to be based on my decisions for this image. Um, so there, there's a real precision there, but then there's other things we could do as well. So let's say, for example, we want to make this stream even better. Well, I could take this and duplicate this layer. So I can just go right click and I'm going to say, New smart objects via copy. I can do it through Lomenzia, but I'm just kind of showing the standard way in Photoshop. If I go and double click this, I can go and make a different set of choices to optimize that water. So we could go in and maybe push the, uh, the whites a little bit more, maybe add a little bit of clarity to it, a little bit of contrast. You're doing some things that would adjust that water a bit differently. And let's just kind of take that as is. We'll see how it goes. And now on this layer, I'm replacing that foreground, but I don't want to bring attention to this rock. I just want to work on the water here. Mm -hmm. So I can add a black layer mask to hide this and then paint in the areas I want to show. So if I hold down Alt and click on Mask and Lumenzia, I get a black mask and I've hidden. So that this layer is no longer doing anything, but this is my stream layer. So let's just call it stream if I can spell right. And I'm kind of reaching for my Wacom pen now, which I really like to use for these things. What I need to do is brush with white on this mask over the areas of the water. And the more precise I can be, the better. If I paint just generally, I might be painting on these rocks that I don't want to hit or these areas here. I can get more precise with the luminosity selection. And this is where I'd start to reach for Lumenzia. So I go up in Lumenzia and the orientation of this panel up top are basically a bunch of different presets that let you preview different versions of a mask or a selection. So if I click on L, I'm asking for a lights selection and I'm going to go and make my icons a little bit smaller because I think at this point they're getting a little absurd. And Lamenta creates these like temporary orange layers on top to give you a preview. So I've got my image and then on top it's creating a preview and I can convert this directly to a layer mask on these layers. Like, so if I click on here, I can just hit mask and I'm going to apply that preview. And now I have that exact layer mask it's right awesome. here. But of course, that, that's not the mask I want in this case, because this would be the example of if I'm in like Lightroom and I use a blend if, this is what a blend if looks like. It's just one flavor, but I don't want the sky to show through here. I don't want these rocks to show through. I just want this river. And this is why you need the selections because you need that control. So I'm gonna go in a different direction. I'm gonna reset this. I'm gonna just alt click on mask to go back to black. And if I go click on L, I'm getting another preview. This time, instead of creating the mask in one step, I'm going to reach for the cell button, which is how you create a selection in Lumenzia. And when I click it, it doesn't look like anything's happened. I'm not seeing marching ants because marching ants are very confusing with a luminosity selection. If I hit Command H, I can show them. And we'll just do the hide extras. There we go. You look at this and you're like, well, that, that seems awfully weird. But what Photoshop is showing me is areas that are at least 50% selected versus areas that are not. But when you saw that mask before, this whole area of rocks had something had done to it and it's not showing here. So the marching ants are really not very useful for luminosity selection. So I, I hide them. Um, but Lomenzia is telling you that there is a selection because this button turns green to let you know that there's an active selection. Mm -hmm. With that selection active, now when I brush, instead of just generically painting with a round brush, I'm going to be painting more in the areas that were more selected or more white in that preview. So I'm going to go and hit B for my brush. I've got white as my foreground and make my brush uh, quite a bit larger. And I generally like to paint with high opacity and low flow, which lets you sort of build up a result. And then what I'm going to do is I can just go brush now over these stream areas, maybe even a smaller brush and we can zoom in a little bit to see things. But as I paint these areas, what's going to happen is it's going to hit that water because it was more selected and it's still going to spill on some of the surrounding areas. So I didn't customize that mask. I didn't try and eliminate the neighboring rocks, 
but it is going to prefer them. So if I alt click this now to see that, you see that preferential treatment. Notice, for example, this edge here of the rocks has this really amazing precision. I mean, here's the image where the rocks are. And then we've got this nice precision along the edge and it's not a hard jagged edge. There's nothing about this that looks unnatural or able to bring through better detail to the water without necessarily showing more detail in this rock that I really don't want to, to highlight. And so you see that adjustment there. And so that sort of gives you an example of something that you, you just could not do with blend if or range mask or some generic function. You need to have that artistry to be able to only paint in these areas. And I can keep painting with this visible. So maybe I go to a little bit larger brush and you see how it just nicely kind of fills in these areas. Um, and in fact, we can look at this side by side. If I click split in Lumenzia, it's gonna give me a side by side view. So here's my blended image and here's my mask. And so as I paint, whenever I let go, it's gonna update and show me that reflection over there. So this is becomes a way of either understanding what's going on or just giving you a little bit more quality control to see like, hey, am I painting over these edges? Because you can see, for example, that, you know, this rock here has some, some paint on it and that may or may not be my intent. And I have full control over that. Sometimes it's hard to see in the blended image. And so looking at the mask can just be a good way of kind of checking like, hey, am I, am I really doing the thing that I wanted to do so that I don't, you know, accidentally build up to some of the results. And let me close this other image here. I don't think we need to use that. Uh, but so that's, yeah, that kind of gives you that sense there, right? And we could go a lot more extreme and add more contrast. It's really, whatever your vision is for what you want to do here, the idea is that you're going to create the adjustment in raw or through an adjustment layer, whatever your method of making a change is, and then use that luminosity approach to reveal it in the areas where it's useful, but not reveal it in areas like the rocks here where it's not helpful. So it's giving that just ultimate local control over the image. That is, that's just fantastic. I mean, that, that, that's borderline Arthur C. Clarke magic right there. <laughs> 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 that's very cool. I'm just thinking back in the days of like the way that I would have approached this if I had I was editing this photo and I wanted to do something to the water. I would have probably started by looking at the channels and stealing a channel and then running some, you know, contrast or whatever, manipulating the channel and then painting out the rocks and all that to reveal just the water and then making my selection. This seems infinitely more precise than that, right? Yeah, I mean, so for example, if we went and pull up the channels panel, right? This would be the traditional way of doing things in Photoshop. We could go to the red channel, the green, yep. the blue, and, and all right. So the yep. blue looks like it's better, but it's not that well separated over here. Yep. And so I'd have to like load this and then I'd have to like intersect it with itself, which is like this weird mathematical thing you do to basically start knocking out the darker areas. And if I wanted at the end of the day to just work on the dark areas, then I'd have to like invert the whole thing. It's pretty complicated and not terribly precise. I'm going to hit command D to deselect what I had here. If I pull back up this preview in Lumenzia, sorry, not clicking that. Um, I've got this preview, but these layers are here for a reason, not just to give you a preview, but also, I don't know why my tablet seems to be like laggy here. My machine is starting to do the fans. It's got something it's going to the background. I know it, it might be, this, it might be this background recording. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but uh, it also lets me adjust things. So I can go directly to, for example, this color conversion layer. So the way this stack is built, it's gonna convert the image to black and white, and then it's gonna select various tones. So I can go to this color conversion and I can say, hey, you know what? Like, what if I wanna have a little bit more sky? I can pick up more of that color, a little bit more of that. Maybe I wanna try and have a little bit less of this here. It's letting me get to be a lot more targeted with these different areas in ways that you wouldn't be able to do with the channels because you, you don't even have color in the channels, right? You need multiple channels to get at color. Yep. And this is giving you that control to go in and just refine these things as you want. So it looks like yellow is probably a lot of the grass if I want to have more or less grass. Uh, and so I can adjust all this. And then you've got this curve, which Lumenzi is building for you. And you could adjust this but an easier thing to do is Lumenzi actually has a slider. So if I want to go and be more selective, I can yank the slider. It's using a different curve. And the way to think about this curve is basically 
on the bottom is what are the tones in my black and white image? And then the Y axis is basically how selected. So what I'm saying here is I mostly want to select things that are bright. This is the nature of a highlights mask versus if I click on something that's dark. Now I'm saying, you know, only select the things that are really dark. So these curves are not something most people are going to adjust here. You just use the sliders, but then on top, you've also got this levels adjustment. So if we come back to our lights here, if I want to refine this as it is, I could go and say, you know what, I, I want to knock out these dark areas. Well, I can just kind of clip some of the shadows. Maybe I want to strengthen the highlight selection. I can bring that in. And so what I'm getting is a much more customized mask or selection. So I can have that precision to take things further. Yeah. So the, the general nature of Lamenta here, you got kind of three parts. You've got the preview buttons. Then you got those next couple of rows, which will let you turn it into something, let you apply it as a selection, as a mask, as a mask on a curve, as a mask on a levels layer, the, all these different ways of applying it. And then down below are other tools to further refine it. So even once you've created a mask like this, you may want to take it even further. So it has kind of multiple stages of preview, apply, and refine. Um, and that's why you have so many buttons is really conceptually just a few things that it's doing. It just gives you a few different ways of doing each of them. Yeah. Yeah. It's fantastic. So, uh, as we move into this Q and a segment, Greg, for folks that want to become Lumenzia power users, where should they start? If I want to dive in deep and I just want to make sure that I've internalized how this thing works and luminosity masking and what the powers are, where should I, where should I start my education at? So if, if this is someone who's not used Photoshop or they're not comfortable with the basic idea of just general selections and masks, not fancy ones that are luminosity based, but just masks in general, I think it's worth, you know, reviewing those basics first. And, and they're, they're not terribly difficult. You know, like I said, like a, a mask is white reveals, black conceals, right? If I go and just use a, a white brush, I have no selection here at all. I can just start brushing. Let me go make this a lot stronger. I can start brushing through this layer and it's revealing it. Just knowing that that's how a mask works mm -hmm. is important before you start getting into the more advanced types of masks and selections. I'm just going to undo that since that's not very nice. Um, so, but, but I think that is the starting point is just making sure you understand just the ground floor of, of Photoshop. And I've got various videos on that. There's lots of them out there, lots of great teachers. Um, and I would learn from a variety of people and, you know, find who can, you know, teach you in a way that makes most sense to you. Yeah. Once you've got just the basics, you don't really need much. Um, I've got a bunch of different videos on Lamenzia. It actually comes with videos. You can click this question mark button and then click on any button in the panel and it'll pop up support, you know, tutorials for any of the various functions. So you can kind of go through and that's a little bit like the, the video user's manual, if you will, for the panel. Um, but I find that for most people, um, that is suitable if you have some idea how to use luminosity masks, if you've been doing them on your own or whatever, it's kind of like, you know, getting an owner's manual in your car. It, it tells you how to, you know, how to fill up the gas tank and how to use the, the windshield wipers, but it doesn't necessarily tell you how to, you know, get the car around a racetrack. Right. Um, you know, for that, I've got a couple of courses that go much, much deeper on the two most popular topics, which are exposure blending, which is what we're doing here when we combine different versions of the image together like this and dodging and burning, which we haven't done. Dodging and burning is where I would go and start adding depth and dimension to this image by selectively making things brighter and darker, altering the color. And, and then beyond my stuff, there's a lot of other things out there. Um, for anyone who's actually picked up Lomenzia, I've got a recommended learning plan that comes with it that kind of speaks to like, hey, here's the specific pathway I would recommend you go through these different things. But I always tell people just kind of you know, bite things off in small pieces. I find a lot of people want to jump in to do like the very hardest things. Mm -hmm. And I find a lot of people get confused by these ideas around exposure blending, whereas dodging and burning, I think, is more intuitive to people. It's a little bit... Um, less esoteric. Um, so I think that can be a really nice place to start and dodging and burning something that can apply to any image. If I want to go, for example, and make it feel like there's more light coming on these foreground areas, I can add a dodge burn layer that's going to help do that just real quick. I'll pull up like, you know, click a, a dodge burn layer. Um, I'm going to go pick a color from the sky. Let's say go sample something that I want to paint into it. And so the way dodging and burning works is 
the brightness is going to determine how much you lighten things and the color gets imparted as well. So I can go and paint on these grassy areas by just going and finding some kind of a targeted selection of these areas. So maybe I come in and I'm just totally playing with this here. This is not something I would thought through and planned, but maybe I grab something like this to grab the brighter areas of the grass. And if I want to knock out the sky, I'm not going to dwell on what I'm doing here. This is one of the more advanced things you can do in Lumenzi, but I can create a selection, invert it. And now I'll get the luminosity in this bottom area without the sky when I click on cell. So I'm just going to grab this as it is. And I create this combined selection, which would look like this if it was a mask. So that's kind of conceptually what's going on behind the scenes here. But with this now, I can take my brush and you know, at a really low flow, start to go in and add a bit of light kind of coming over these areas. And I'm just doing subtle bits of building here. But what ends up happening is you're adding some, let's see, we gotta probably go a little bit stronger. Not that strong, it's funny. There's always like a middle ground. For some reason, I always zip right past it when I'm adjusting this tool. But what I'm doing here is just adding a bit of light on top of this grass. And you see that starting to come through. And you can imagine that as you do that more across the image, I can brighten up the, the different highlights. I can take these shadow areas and darken them down and it will start to feel much more three-dimensional as I do that. And those concepts, I find that um, people grasp onto a little bit faster, uh, even though I'm just yeah. totally zipping through it here. I love that. And that, that technique is what you would use on like that bodybuilder that you mentioned, right? To, to emphasize the muscle structure and just kind of make it more, more pleasing to look at than the actual raw file. You're going to go in and dodge and burn, pop those highlights a little bit and suppress those, the blacks and kind of contour, right? That's what you're doing when you're dodging and burning. Yeah. So what I have right now is I'm painting in the highlights in the shadows area, right? So I'd probably go in and paint some highlights on the right edge of the mountain, make it feel like the sun's coming kind of around there. I'd start to paint in more in the sky to make it look like the sun is bursting here. I'd go and darken down, you know, the shadows and the rocks to make them feel more cragged and, and, you know, like jagged rocks. I'd probably, you know, light some of the highlights in the water. I'm basically going around every little area and trying to take the light that's already there and accentuating it in a way that draws the attention where I want it. You're, you're just kind of sculpting each little piece of it. So you can spend a lot of time with the dodging and burning. And I find that that's where people tend to spend the most time when they get to the much more advanced artistry is the dodging and burning. And, and quite frankly, it's the fun part. It's the part where you really get to express and differentiate your image in a way that will, will really truly set it apart. I mean, I'm, I'm just kind of quickly touching a few little areas here but you know, by the time we start really adding the sun and all the other little details in the foreground, this is going to totally transform this image from what is pretty flat here to, uh, I think I've got the finished, here's the finished version of the image I worked on in the past. You can see when you really dodge and burn where I've made the sky much brighter here, the foreground has a lot more shape to it, but then like the dark area has got a little darker you know, these areas here, when you create more shadow, and then you create more highlight, you create more shape and volume. Like these rocks feel three-dimensional in a way that this version feels comparatively flat to me right now. It needs that extra dodging and burning work for it to start to jump off the page and, and really start to feel like, oh, wow, I'm staring down this like crazy Norwegian stream and it, what an amazing experience it had to be. Yeah. That is crazy. Yeah. I'm getting that course. I want to dive in. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> All right. Well, cool, man. Thank you for, thank you for going through this. I think we should open it up now uh, to Q and a, are you game to take some questions from the folks that are, that are in the room? Yeah, absolutely. I'll stop screen sharing so you can see you again. All right. So let me go ahead and uh, allow folks to unmute themselves and start your video. Here you go. And then I'm going to unspotlight both of us, Greg, so that we can just be part of the crew. There we go. All right. Now we're in Zoom meeting. So here we go. Let's dive in. Steven, you look like you have a question. <laughs> I, I don't. I, I just want to thank Greg again for giving us, I, I would say, and Greg, you can speak to this better than I can, but just a, an initial flavor of, of the control um, uh, uh, that you have um, 
over kind of realizing, you know, the photograph to its full potential. I think the other thing, and Greg's done a really great job of kind of speaking to getting a flavor for the tools here. But I think for me, the learning process is the bigger value add. And Greg, you can speak to this as well. The thought process that I have to go through to tune and fine tune my images in the way that Greg just demonstrated is, is the real win for me because it helps to inform my thinking as a photographer better. It's great to get the, the end result. That's all, that's all wonderful. That's the goal. But you, you, what Greg, Greg's tools do for me is inform my thinking process in a way that has not been informed before. It gives me more insight, both at the time of capture you know, the time, initial pre, you know, pre-production and then final production in Photoshop, right? Mm -hmm. So my thinking process from beginning to end is much more informed. I can get closer to the results that I want to get to, right? And Lumenzia is just in a way, Greg, you can speak to this as well, a means to an end to that, right? To that, yeah. that thought process. Yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, the, what... As you were going through your demo, Greg, kind of the things that were, were popping up in my, in my mind, it echoes what you're saying, Stephen, is just you it seems like when i go out to a, a location like we're, we're we may be going to yosemite this weekend i will look at it differently than i would as if you know if, if i had just the raw file i know i can do certain things with the raw file and get get pretty much there but it's i don't think i would ever get to the okay this is gallery level but when i'm out there i can think yeah that sky i'm getting work on that i can i can use a luminosity masking on that sky and that waterfall right there i could probably do something with that later instead of making sure i got it in the shot and just kind of hoping yeah. that i can do post processing later michael michael rhino you had some some questions right? yeah yeah the, the one thing and thank you so much again for doing this um I was going to say, the reason I don't have a lot of questions is because you're so thorough in answering all of those <laughs> in those, uh, in, the, in one in this uh, um, session right here, but in your master classes and that, I, you know, I, I can't speak highly enough about how thorough and how detailed you are in those. And that's the reason why I don't really have a lot of questions with regards to the actual process itself. W one of the questions that I did have and kind of um, following up on what uh, Frederick had asked earlier about, you know, Capture One and, and so forth. And, and I realized that's one of the, the things that Capture One that I've noticed that I can't do in terms of what you can do here on these luminosity masks. Again, they have their Luma range and, you know, some things that you can sort of do. But like you said, it's, it's not as specific as, you know, your programs and so forth. You can't do the brushes and that within a luminosity mask from what I can tell. And that's where it, it, its limitations are there. The question that I had was more to do with, is there a disadvantage to say doing some of the raw initial raw processing of the an original file in capture one and then moving it over migrate you know, over into photoshop slash lumenzia and doing my luminosity mask adjustments over there versus starting off over in the adobe program whether it's um uh lightroom or adobe camera raw within photoshop and just keeping it all on that platform Good question. Yeah, no, it's a great question. Um, and, it, and it's perfectly fine to do that. And you should work with the raw tool that you prefer. Um, the, the limitation you'll run into is that you don't have the raw smart object, right? So in the demo here, I, you know, I said, Hey, let's, let's go do something different to that stream, right? We applied a little clarity and some highlights and I did it on the raw right within Photoshop. If you had this you would either have to use, you know, the close enough method in Photoshop, or you'd have to go back to Capture One, find the version that matches the one that you're working with in Photoshop, right? Because you got to start from the same place if you're going to make a little tweak, adjust it, export it, bring in that layer, um, which is perfectly feasible. And I think if you work in a way where you try and preserve you know, for example, here I've got like a sky version, another sky version, a foreground version. Like if you keep the different versions of your images over in Capture One, then you can export something that is like, you know, I just changed this one thing about that version. So it, it's not necessarily a handicap, but it is a watch out. And, and I find there's a lot of flexibility with having things in the camera raw smart objects. Um, the other thing that happens is, you know, I always tell people like luminosity mass and selections are great but they are not perfect and they are not meant to do all the work. The, the 
the really beautiful work comes from a combination of three things, having a, a good luminosity selection, having a, you know, well-processed raw image, mm -hmm. um, and your brush technique, as you convert that selection into a mask, if you just hammer away in a sloppy way, you know, you can create a bad result just because I have this selection guiding the tool doesn't mean I'm going to get a great result. I mean, I can use a ruler on a piece of paper and I can still make a mess on that paper. Same, same kind of story. Mm -hmm. um, when you really uh, refine the, the art of getting the perfect raw, having one raw match the other is part of that process, right? So if the shadows in my foreground layer look somewhat like the shadows in my sky layer, then as I transition between them, I don't have to have as perfect of a mask or even with a perfect mask, perhaps it would never come together in a realistic way because there's that soft transition where it's a little bit of both. Um, and so, you know, being able to do it with camera raw in Photoshop is a real advantage where I can see them and suddenly decide, you know what, like the cyan color, of the shadows, is not quite right. Or the tonality is it's a little off and I can tweak that in a way that's not as easy to do from Lightroom, from Capture One. You certainly can. Um, so my preferred workflow is actually to start in Lightroom and then bring everything to Photoshop. And I, the reason that Lightroom's in the mix for me is one, to just organize all the files. And two, because I love virtual copies. So if I have three versions of the image in Lightroom, it's really easy to copy from one or the other. It's like almost instantaneous. I just copy paste. In Photoshop, unfortunately, Camera Raw is this great tool, but it's not quite a first-class citizen. I can't just do a virtual copy. I can't just copy-paste settings in, in the same way. I mean, you, you can do some of that, but it's not as quick and easy. So I like to start the process in Lightroom where it's really fast, and then I'll move to Photoshop. And then I, once I move to Photoshop, I'm kind of done with you know, Lightroom most of the time. It's rare that I'd go back. At that point, I kind of stick with what I've brought over there. Um, so there's many, many different ways you can approach this and they're all pretty, pretty good. Um, it just kind of depends on what, you know, what kind of a workflow do you want to use? Um, you know, if you really prefer the, the raw results from another processor, by all means, use that raw processor. To my taste, the differences are not that huge. And the big differentiation to me is not the initial starting point. It's what I do in the end. You, know, you saw I blended these three layers together but you also saw when I finished with everything else that I did in the final version that I showed just briefly in Photoshop, how much better it looked. So to me, the raw, you know, it needs to be good, um, but it's not the end point. And I find the differences between these tools, like uh, Lightroom's a little better here and Capture One's a little better here. I find it's a little bit of a wash. And at the end of the day, they all do a great job. So I really prefer the workflow that I get with the raw being right in Photoshop. So I have everything in one place. Yeah, so I'll just okay. add... Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead, Stephen. No, I'll ahead. just, you know, I'm very agnostic about tools, right? I like using Capture One for the majority of my raw conversion for specific reasons, the lumen, lumen masking being one of them. But, you know, I used to have a good buddy that was a professional car mechanic, and he generally used snap on tools, except for certain tools, like his torque wrench was a German stall villa. And he had very good reasons why he used the stall villa rather than snap on torque wrench he didn't have to reset the spring every time he wanted to change torque right so it just made his workflow easier right and and so for me all that really matters at the end of the day is like can i get to the goal that i want to mm -hmm. right and if i have to start with smart objects in photoshop to get to the goal and use lamenzia as an set of enhancements to do that i'm fine with that I, i'm not going to limit myself to like, I'm firmly in the Lightroom Photoshop camp or the Capture One blah, 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 or the Capture One Photoshop camp, whatever. I think, the, the, again, the thing for me that Greg has helped inform my thinking about is at the time of Capture, I'm starting to think about how am I going to make this image be fully realized and what I'm going to do now so that I can start thinking about downstream the tools that I want to use at the right place in time to get the final, to get to the final destination. Yeah. 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 That's interesting. The whole, the whole thing, I don't know, the, the, the ecosystem, the Lightroom Photoshop ecosystem, and then the round tripping out of third party applications like Affinity Photo or Capture One or whatever comes next in their Luminar, et cetera. I think about that world and I've talked to everybody from all of these companies and it's, it's interesting. They all take a different 
kind of direction at the same problem. But at the end of the day, I was having a, a conversation with, um, uh, what's his name, Matt Kluskowski the other day. And, and we're talking about just why he lives in Photoshop Lightroom and why he loves it. And his, his perspective was, you know what? Uh, it, it would, I think he drew the analogy of Vegas. He's like, you know what? You could go to Vegas and you could stay off strip and be okay and pay less money you're gonna give certain things up or you could pay a little more and stay in a big gigantic hotel and have a maid service in the restaurants and all that stuff. You may not use it all, but you know it's there and you know it's a known quantity. So his his perspective was, you know what, I, I, there's more power in the Lightroom Photoshop combination that I could ever use as an artist. I could ever hope to use as an artist. And there's been great works done that I could never approach the quality of in these applications. I'm just gonna use that, right? Instead of using these other ones. And then there's a there's an argument of creative cloud fees and all that stuff. We talked about this in the mixer, Greg, like creative cloud fees and all that other stuff that people that people complain about. I don't know. You know, I as I go through this path, it it seems like the Occam's razor is the Lightroom Photoshop combination. No disrespect, like you know, Stephen, I'm the uh, I'm the I'm the tool agnostic person as well, but the if if it comes down to what greg was talking about in the interview of i just want to tell stories i don't care how i get there i want to tell stories i want to make great stuff and i want to have fun while i'm doing it you gotta devote your brain energy in one direction and you know not a hundred percent commit but focus on that thing to get really good at it and forget about all the other choices for a while and just get really good at this one thing so i don't know hey mark Charette, welcome Good day. How you doing? Good night. I, I, Good, day. I had one, one, <laughs> Good morning. First thing. Yeah, it's early out there. Uh, one follow-up question real quick too was, it, or I guess maybe a point is one of the other advantages I suppose to the Adobe systems is that you're able, it's when you're using multiple images, right? I mean, in a lot of your luminosity masking, you're using multiple exposure, you know, images with that, that and with Capture One, you're sort of limited to, to just the, the single image. No. And I also am thinking of it in terms of <laughs> <laughs> Steven's way, uh, nodding no, so maybe I'm wrong with that. The, the other part of that is the, um, uh, for instance, like photo stacking and so forth and that we're using multiple images. It's maybe just a smoother process to just do all of that in, over in the Adobe system and that as opposed to trying to do that over in Capture One and then bringing it across. I, I don't still agree. nodding no, so maybe I'm, I, I may, I may <laughs> be off, off the mark on that. <laughs> Well, you know, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to knock good tools, you know, regardless of who yeah. makes them, right? We yeah. we live in an age, and I'm sure Greg and, and Frederick would agree, where we have an embarrassment of riches available to us today. Yeah. And, sure. um, you know, the way I look at these tools is how can I use them, most importantly, to inform my thinking as a photographer to kind of get to the results that will resonate with viewers, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it's important, and we as photographers, I think maybe it's it's just a human thing, but yeah, we tend to be tribal, and we, I call it that digital Stockholm syndrome, where you know you get locked into a certain brand, whether it be cameras or software or whatever, and you feel like this is the right thing because <laughs> I spent I spent thousands of dollars and time invested in this. And I'm gonna die on this hill, no matter what. You know, Frederick, I, I used to see when I worked when I worked as a molecular biologist in in biotech. Right, we had different business divisions, as I'm sure you encountered in your corporate career, and we had competition between like, oh, is it better to detect this mutation that confers risk for you know uh, fragile X syndrome with TACMAN or with uh, PCR OLA, blah 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 blah, right? And of course, you'd have factions within the company. You know, vi well, everything should be this or everything should be that or blah 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 here at the bot the bottom line is the customer does not care all right. the customer wants to know does this patient have this genetic disease at birth or not right mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and so right it, it's i understand the tribal aspect of that and you know it's it's fun to kind of have discussions and dialogue and and debates about all of this for me the destination is kind of the goal Right. And yeah, I'll just use yeah. whatever means gets me to the destination that will create the most value and quality for my viewers. Right. Just like mm -hmm. I want the most accurate, precise genetic test. Right. For genetic diseases, infectious diseases. I want, you know, 
the most consistent, reproducible, you know, um, controlled image that resonates with viewers. And I don't really care at the end of the day which camp I'm in. I just the destination is the goal for me, rather yeah. than yeah. you know the the tools. I'm gonna it's be. I'm the, gonna be. I'm gonna be a stick in the mud other, on that one. Uh, That's fine. Say, sorry, Mark. I was gonna I'm say gonna be, the only people that care about. Like with in, with Leonardo da Vinci, right? The only people that care about the the paintbrush, whether it was horse hair or camel hair, were other artists, and yeah. the actual viewers of that couldn't give a shit, right? <laughs> no, <laughs> painting. They're just like, it's a great painting, great. I don't care how we got there. I'm gonna enjoy the painting. Yeah, Sorry, Mark, I, go ahead. I, I still enjoy the dialogue, right? So that's great. Yeah, yeah, it's a good dialogue, but it's it's a it's an artist to artist dialogue. Yeah. When the actual work is for the end consumer, it's like a chef to chef dialogue about what oven and knives did you use to create this award winning dish. When the person sitting at the table eating it couldn't care less, they're just like, "This is delicious. Give me more." <laughs> so, so. Yeah. At, at the end of the day, yeah. it's you know you invest in your your skill set. I remember when I was an engineer at Ford, I ended up in the back seat of a Lincoln Town Car with a professional race car driver at the wheel. Yeah. And this guy did stuff. In that stodgy old, you know, I mean, it's like, you, you, that's the kind of thing you'd get in for like a chauffeured night around the town or something, right? And um, this guy was doing stuff with that car that I couldn't possibly do with a Ferrari, right? Like so, drifting. <laughs> so we're going like 80 miles an hour on a track where like 40 was like the literal speed limit. You're whipping through all the tires squealing. It was just because the guy knew how to work the tool and he knew how to drive. And I think it's the same thing where I've seen amazing art. This guy, I forget his name, some guy in Mexico the other day is using Microsoft Paint to, to make his digital creations. It looked awesome. Yeah. So I, I think at the end of the day, um, you know, what's most important is you have something to say and you have an idea how to say it, right? Like what's the destination with that journey? When you know those things, then yes, you will have preferences for which tool does it most easily for you, but you'll probably be able to work with a lot of different tools and get good results. Right. Yeah. No, yeah, for sure. Well, cool. Well, we'll wrap it up here. Does anyone have any further questions or anything you want to throw into the mix before we end it? I just want to thank you, Frederick, uh, for organizing this. This has been great. And for Greg to being a guest, um, uh, I learned new stuff today as well, which is, which was really great. So thanks That's for great. putting this together. Yeah. The, and the timing of this was perfect for me too, just in that I'm just getting through it. Let's see, I'm hundred percent way through the dodging and burning masterclass and I'm about 65% through the, um, uh, exposure blending class. And so the timing of this whole discussion was just perfect. And again, thank you so much for one, all of the free tutorials you have out there on YouTube. And then the, like I say, those master classes are well worth the uh, investment and learning experience on those. I, the, the time, the time I've put into those has been well worth every, every hour, every minute of that. So <laughs> mm -hmm. appreciate yeah, it. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Well, with that, we'll we'll end this. Thank you, Greg, for your time today, man. Uh, it's been it's been an honor and a pleasure. Looking forward to diving in. I'll share some of my Yosemite shots with you, if I <laughs> if I come if I come back with anything decent that I'm uh, that I'm not embarrassed to show, I'll share it with the community. <laughs> yeah, but please do. I'm I'm itching to start flying around and seeing the world again. So. Oh man, yeah. I finally got I finally got scheduled for my vaccine. So. <laughs> <laughs> all right <laughs> I, just, I just got my first one sunday my first one was sunday so i'm moving in that direction of being vaccinated very good yeah yeah as we all are very good okay all right folks well we'll see you uh i guess i'll see you guys tomorrow evening right for the for the image critique or the image competition actually all right have a good rest of your day you guys be safe and uh we'll see you soon thank you, thank you. thanks Bye. This is Twitter.